everyone and welcome to The Edit. My name is Matilda Marozzi. I'm an investigative journalist and radio producer at ABC Radio Melbourne. Firstly, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of this land from which I'm speaking to you today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I invite you to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land from which you are viewing this webinar tonight. We're here to learn how, to, how we can tell stories in an engaging way. And that's something Indigenous Australians have been doing on this land for thousands of years. I invite each of you to connect with locals, local elders, past, present and emerging, and to learn the stories that they've been telling about our country. The Edit is the Melbourne Press Club's program for early career journalists and students. It's sponsored by the Copyright Agency. And it's, the idea is it's a space where you can learn new skills, um, usually meet colleagues in person, and, and kind of find out more about the industry that you want to be involved in. Um, this event was actually meant to happen in March, <laughs> just at the start when coronavirus was really um, hitting and we had to cancel it like many events, it was cancelled. Uh, but you can still ask questions, feel free to use the Q&A function and I'll try to get to as many of them as possible. The person you're here to hear from tonight isn't me, it's our guest Lisa Miller. She's an award-winning journalist and now the co-host of News Breakfast. She's worked across print, television and radio in not only Australia but also the US and Europe. Um, in 2005 she won a Walkley Award for her investigative reporting on the wrongful deportation of Australian woman Vivian Solon. She also has strong links to the DART Centre for Journalism and Trauma and served as a director of the organisation until December 2019. Um, Lisa, thanks so much for joining us and welcome. Oh, it's my pleasure. I'm so glad. I remember when you first invited me to this, the biggest worry was that I'd had bronchitis and I didn't know whether my voice was going to last. And now, I mean, look at us now. <laughs> but I'm, I'm glad we've been able to finally make it and I'm really um, keen to take questions and have a chat with you tonight. Yeah. Um, I was interested because you've been in journalism a long time and I wanted to know why are you still in journalism? Why are you still working in this career? Oh, God, because I love it. I, I absolutely love it. The thrill that I get um, about what I do is still the same that I had when I first started and I feel eternally grateful for that. Even now when the alarm goes off at 3 a.m. and I have a moment of, oh, what am I doing? By the time I'm in the office and we're discussing what's broken overnight around the world, what's happened in Europe, um, the pictures that we're getting out of Russia, I feel the adrenaline going and I just I just love it. And I know that I'm, I'm very, very lucky that that's how I feel because a lot of people do sort of get to this point in their career and feel a bit jaded or burned out. And there have certainly been moments, it's not all, you know, beer and skills. There have been moments where I've had some really hard look at myself and difficult challenges. And we can talk about that, you know, over the next little while. But yeah, I guess it's as simple as that. I love it still. And you've worked across, um, you know, print, television and radio and now a lot of journalists are expected to, to do all of those. But um, do you have a favourite media that you like working in, one that you feel particularly uh, attracted to or connected with? Well, look, I still love to write. Um, I do like to see a beautifully crafted sentence up here on the page and, and the thrill of that. And, in fact, just this afternoon um, I was writing a farewell article for the Gympie Times, which is where I started my career, and um, I sat there and they only wanted 350 words, which is not a lot, but this paper has been around forever and it gave me my launching pad. So if I'm going to appear in the very last print edition, then I wanted it to be something really Good. And I sat there thinking about the first couple of sentences for half an hour, writing, rewriting, writing. And when they finally came to me, 
I'm so happy with them. Like, I'm just so happy with them. I want to keep reading them because I'm so happy with them. Um, and so I feel like that, that feeling about writing actually goes across all the mediums, whether it's radio. Um, I can still remember one of the radio current affairs stories I wrote in the US. And there are particular lines that I, I don't know where they came from, but they they came and they still I still think about them. Um, I just think there's something so beautiful as a, a crafted sentence. And even now in television, of course, I'm doing it much less now, but I'm still working with backroads and foreign correspondent, and I still get the opportunity to craft words. And that I think is the basis of what we do and what I love. Yeah. Um, well few questions you mentioned that you know because you love your job you're able to get up at 3 a.m or whatever ridiculous time your alarm goes up and use breakfast yeah but correct. um how you they've asked how do you manage the early starts on use breakfast and I guess um when you're a foreign coro your sleep pattern must have been a bit all over the place as well oh yeah it was well I was basically on call 24 7 for well so since the end of 2001, I've spent 12 years overseas, but the last block that I did was nine years. So six years in Washington, D.C. from 2009 to 2015. And then I went to London for three years. And that period in London, um, Europe was on alert. There were terrorist attacks. There was always something happening. I got to the point where the phone would ring beside me and I'd just pick it up and it wouldn't matter if I was deep asleep or if it was 10 o'clock at night or four o'clock in the morning, I would answer it, what's happened? And you would get the very clear instruction straight away. Earthquake in Italy, planes booked at six. Um, you know, I remember 2017 being a year when I thought, right, I'm going to try and get my life back a bit because 2016, we had Brexit, we'd had the Paris attacks at the end of 2015. It had there'd been so much going on. And so New Year's Eve on 2016, I went to bed early. I was still a little worried there might be something happening in Europe. And then at 1.58 a.m. on January the 1st, the phone went and there'd been a terrorist attack in Istanbul and they'd booked us on a six o'clock flight. So I thought, okay. And then, of course, 2017 ended up being an absolutely massive year. So that totally is not the question that you asked about sleep. So the point is that I feel like my sleep while I was overseas was so all over the shop that now the alarm goes off at 3 a.m., but I have a, a structured day and a steady job. So, you know, I can come home and have a bit of a nap if I need a bit of a nap. Um, I try not to, but generally I go to bed by 8 o'clock. I'll watch the news and 7.30 and then go to bed. Yeah. And um, that routine, at least you feel like you can consistently get enough sleep. Oh, well, maybe not. <laughs> but what I can do that I've never been able to do before is commit to friends to go out to a lunch or to, to play tennis or to go to a Pilates class, yes. things that I have never done for the last 15 years, basically. So I actually feel like it's all how you view it, you know. Some people might see 3 a.m. I see structured life. Yeah. Um, foreign correspondent is a very revered role. I think people, you know, might look up to that as the pinnacle of their career. But I wonder, was that the case for you? Did you look at when you started your journalism career? Was that your aim? One day I'm going to get there. Yeah. Yeah, it always was. I wanted to be a journalist from when I was seven years old and I just kept at it. I remember um, when I finally um, got my first foreign posting, school friends said to me, you always said you were going to do that, you know. So I don't recall sort of being noisy about it, but just determined about it. And, oh, look, the, the thrill of it, I can't tell you, even, you know, three postings I had, two to America and then the one to London, there is nothing like it when that phone rings and it's the international editor to tell you that you've been successful and you're going to be the Europe bureau chief or whatever the position yeah. is. Um, 
you know, you put down the phone and you just want to weep with joy. It is extraordinary and it's such a privilege. Was it all it was cracked up to be? Oh. Without yeah. your expectations? Ma- massive roller coaster. I mean, huge sacrifices um, that you have for family and relationships and mental health, which is why I became involved with um, the Dart Centre for Journalism and Trauma, because when I started work in the early days working for newspapers, I did a lot of sort of police round stuff and things that I look back on now and realise that I just, you know, blundered my way into Um, you know, what we called them death knocks, you know, Mm -hmm. and I had no training or understanding of what I was doing or the hurt that I was causing by re-traumatising people because I was so inexperienced with how I was dealing with them. And so, you know, as a foreign correspondent, um, probably I learned more about trauma, but I also absorbed more of that trauma in a way, Um, which, you know, at the end of the day, I think I'm a better person now than I was 20 years ago. I think I have more greater empathy, but the foreign postings, although they were absolutely the career highlight and I I, um, will never forget the opportunities that I had, it certainly comes at a cost and you have to accept that that's one of the prices that you pay yeah um if you might have joined a bit late you're listening to the edit it's the melbourne press club's program for young and early career journalists my name is matilda morozzi i'm from the abc and i've recently been elected to the press club board and i'm with lisa miller um, she's now the co-host of news breakfast but as you're hearing she had another uh, a number of postings as a foreign correspondent um you mentioned just before a bit about you know, trying to balance, it's difficult when you're a foreign correspondent to balance your personal life and your professional life. And you talked about 2017 and I was in the UK in 2017 uh, working as a reporter and it was a rough year. There was the Westminster uh, terror attack and then yeah, the United United Manchester. Market, yeah, Manchester. Manchester first. The Manchester yeah. Arena attack with Ariana Grande, then the Westminster Bridge attack where our office was in the attack zone, so it was cordoned off. Uh, The London Bridge attack, which was right near my home, I was actually at a party very close by. There was the hung election, which involved sleepless nights. Our office manager ended up buying bedding for the office because he couldn't bear to see us sleep with our feet hanging over the edge of the couch or come in in the morning and discover us um, asleep yeah. on the floor that rather than rather than sort of going okay well this is not a sustainable situation these people should not be sleeping in the office he <laughs> delightfully said well, I'm going to get them a blanket <laughs> but amidst all this I understand um, you had a difficult family situation and that's the year when your dad who you were quite close to um, he died that year is that that must yeah. have been incredibly difficult did you yeah. manage to get time off and come home? Like, um, Well, I got time off, and I'm happy to be pretty honest about this, but I got time off um, two months before he died, but that was because I was mentally at the end of my, you know, I, I was done. I was really done. I had a cameraman who said to me that he couldn't, cope anymore and he needed to leave the bureau and he was a friend of mine and he was a terrific worker and the two of us I remember he gave me his resignation letter he'd handwritten it and we sat on the floor in the camera room and cried like because he was at the end I was at the end it was just it was the year also a great mentor of mine Mark Colvin died and I remember um Mark calling me two days before he died and I was in a taxi and he called me and asked if it was a convenient time to talk and I only realised later that he was ringing to say goodbye but I was so caught up in everything. I mean, I, we did talk, thank God we talked. Of course I wanted to talk to him but and then um, 
this extraordinary situation happened where someone I'd interviewed the year before, I had returned to interview him. He was a farmer in Somerset and he'd been terrific talent on Brexit related matters. And so we went out to Somerset to interview him on the Friday and um, he'd said, oh, have you ever been? He was in his early 70s and he said, oh, have you ever been um, to some of those posh clubs on Pall Mall? And I said, oh, no. And he said, oh, well, I'm the, you know, National Agricultural Farmers Club president and I'll take you there. Anyway, on the Monday we rang to tell him that the story had gone to air and to send him a copy and he died. Oh, wow. And it was one of those moments where... I didn't know him very well, but when you'd had, oh, and there was the French election as well, which was incredible. When you'd had, you know, three, four terrorist attacks that you'd covered starting, remember that was a year that started with the Istanbul terrorist attacks. So I'd probably covered five attacks. I'd lost a mentor. And then suddenly I interview someone who dies the day after I interview him. He'd been hit by his tractor on the farm. Um, I started feeling like everything I touched was bad. And in the end, I came home for two weeks and the ABC said to me, um, do you want to stay for longer? You should probably stay for longer. And I said, yeah, I need to stay for longer. So I ended up having a month back in Australia and the international editor said to me at the time, are you done? Like, you know, it's okay. There is no shame in you saying that's it. You know, you've, you've done good. You can come out. Um, but I said, no, I wanted to go back. And I did another year and finished my posting. And I was glad I did that because I think if I had come out at that point, then it, it would have felt like things were left undone in a way for me but 2017 I mean if you were there in London you know it Matilda that was probably well it is hands down the most challenging year that I ever had personally and professionally. Oh I bet and, and you talked a little bit there about um, trauma and I wonder if you can tell me how you first came to be involved in the DART Centre for Trauma and tell us what they do. Uh, so I first became involved with DART when I covered the hanging of Van Nguyen in Singapore, who was a young Melbourne um, guy who was a Vietnamese Australian. He'd arrived here on a boat as a baby with his mother and family and on December the 2nd, December the 2nd or 3rd, um, 2005, he was hanged in Singapore. Um, that year I was back in Brisbane in Australia and I had been asked to go and cover the last two weeks of the fight for his life and the bid by the Australian government and others to try and keep him alive. Um, again, at that point in my career, Matilda, I had not given any thought to the cumulative effect of being exposed to traumatic stories. And, you know, I won't go into the details about it, but I came back from that and felt like I needed sort of help, but there wasn't really any help. Like the ABC at that point was not really sort of offering anything. No one sort of said, hey, do you think you need to go and talk to a counsellor or anything like that? And um, But they were starting to get involved with the DART Centre for Journalism and Trauma, which is an international group. It's based out of Columbia University, out of the journalism school. And it has two reasons for being. One of them is to give us the tools as people in the media to um, continue to be able to do our jobs to cope with traumatic situations, to be able to cover them and report on them and not have breakdowns or become alcoholics or divorcees or anything like that. And the other thing is also to make us better reporters and camera operators and photographers in the way we approach people who have suffered trauma and that has been such a learning experience for me simple tips like if you're going to interview someone who has gone through trauma to let them have the control to let them decide where they want to do the interview who they want to have with them when they do the interview um, things like that that I had just never really 
thought of before, which is embarrassing to say, but hey, you know, we've, we've all got to learn. And so that was in 2005, at the end of 2005. And from then on, it was little did I know how much trauma reporting I would do. Like just, yeah. it's extraordinary to think of it. I mean, the Sandy Hook school shooting in the US where 20 children died was probably, you know, up there with, but I mean, then you think, okay, and then I carried covered Paris where, you know, 140 people died and then I'm locked out of our office because people have died on Westminster Bridge and I'm trying to look after the London staff. And so when I talk about it now and put it all together, I think people probably go, wow, they might sort of walk on the other side of the street from me. But the Dart Centre gave me so many good tips. I've got to tell you a quick story, Matilda, if that's okay, um, that one of the times I realised how much I had learned um, from being involved with the Dart Centre was when I, um, oh, you know what else happened in 2017? That was the Grenfell building fire, wasn't it? It was. Yeah, I watched that happen live. Yep. Oh, God, so that just reminds like that that gives you an idea of how 2017 was, that there were so many things that happened that I have forgotten one of the biggest events. So I the first time that I've actually slept at home, have had a day off, I go to the dentist because that's what you do, you know. And um I'm sitting there and the dentist doesn't know what I do. You know, it's my regular dentist, but we don't talk much. They just clean and... Yeah, it's work. hard when there's stuff in your mouth, I guess. Yeah. And then, so the dentist, it was a woman, she walked in, she said, how are you going? I said, fine, fine. And um, she said, have you been flossing? And I said, um, no. <laughs> and I could feel tears start coming. And because I don't floss and it's a real bugbear of mine, right? And it was like, man, this is like the final straw. Now I'm under pressure for not flossing. And then, and so I'm trying to stop the tears. And then I realise, wow, nope, the floodgates have opened and I'm wearing those big plastic dentist glasses and I'm trying to take them off and wipe away the tears. And, and then I start laughing because I feel so encouraged that I actually knew what was going on, that it was not about the flossing. It was actually the release of the stress of the last five months. And so then through tears and laughter, I'm explaining to the dentist it's okay. I'm actually crying, but I'm laughing because I know what's going on and I know I'm not having a breakdown. This is just the stress. Anyway, so I got out of the dentist and I rang Kate McMahon, who runs the Dart Centre here in um, Australia. And so I rang her and said, you are not going to believe what's happened. Uh, you have taught me so much over the years that I actually feel fine about the fact that I've just lost the plot at the dentist. It's funny. I think um, for me, uh working in live radio, there's been a number of times where you're covering traumatic events as they're unfolding and people are in shock and you're in shock. And it's always when I feel safe and I'm away from the adrenaline and away from the stress. Like when I'm in the stressful, when I'm working and it's adrenaline and it's stress, like I can cope. And it's just when you get home and you're like, maybe you're with your family or you're in a safe environment and you're not on that, your body's like, your mind and your body's like, okay, I think I can process that now. So it's very interesting. Um, just a reminder to everyone listening, if you've got a question, you can put it in the live Q&A. Um, Eileen's put one in here, um, kind of going to trauma and, and learning to deal better with people who've experienced traumatic ex experiences and asking what's the right and wrong way to go about a death knock. Mm. Well, I mean, it, there's so many different exam. There's so many different examples. Um, but what I would say, as a rule, is that it's not necessarily the wrong thing to do um, because some people do want to talk. Some people, um, some people do want to um, say good things about the person who's passed away. Oh, um, I'll give you an example. And, and I, look, I, I take pride in the fact that people I have um, death knocked, and I hate that term, but um, people I've dealt with at high moments of trauma, I've stayed in touch with and they felt um, 
safe enough with my reporting that they have been happy to do things with me again down the road. And that was the thing that always stuck with me, that it's one thing to get someone to open the door to you, but it's another thing for you to be invited back. And I think that has always been something I've really held tight to. Um, what is the right way to do it? Well, I, I never approached them direct. I would approach through a family or a spokesperson and just always be very, very truthful about how you're doing it and why you're doing it. Um, I was the first foreign broadcaster to get an interview with one of the Sandy Hook parents, um, um, Veronique Posner and her husband lost their five-year-old son. He was a twin and their daughters survived. And Veronique and Lenny, you know, are still, like I'm still in contact with them, you know, almost a decade later now. And that makes me feel that well, something I'm doing must be right. But it's not like I can give you a checklist. I think, you know, the number one rule is... On Sorry? It depends, on, it depends on the person as well, I think. And yeah. what they what they are getting out of speaking to you and because um, I think often people, uh, journalists are happy, not happy, but journalists are used to listening to uncomfortable stories and maybe their friends and family aren't. So often yeah. I've found, you know, friends and family are shying away from asking them about what happened, but a journalist will come and say, tell me, and they can unload in a way um so that can be helpful for people I've, I've been surprised because I've hated doing those calls where you're like oh yeah I want to speak to you about your son that's just been killed or mm. whatever it might be it's very difficult but I've, I've been surprised more often than not people have been happy to speak if you do it in a respectful way I guess so but that's, I guess, you know, and, and there, are, there are other things that I will tell you that are must, must do's, you know, be accurate. There is nothing worse when you're dealing with someone who's been through trauma to misspell a name or to pronounce the name incorrectly. Um, things like that just really, it's like, wow, okay, I've entrusted you with my story, but you haven't had the decency to pronounce my dead son's name correctly. Um, yeah, look, it, it's, you know, it's, it's not an easy lot of boxes you can tick, but I guess one of, the, one of the very important rules is to not do further damage to them. Don't, don't create more trauma. Be, be so, so wary and, and be thinking all the time whether what you are doing. And, and, you know, there are people at high point of trauma who can't make decisions in the correct way and you need to know that as well and need to know when to not ask the questions because it's it's wrong to put people like that through that because they may not be making the best decisions for themselves yeah um i've got a quick couple of questions coming through um like this one from christopher he says thanks for taking the time to speak to us um and he's asking about you know getting your first job uh with the situation as it is and job cuts at the abc and newspapers uh, what advice would you give to young journos about to start their careers, about applying for cadetships or trying to get a foot in the door? So uh, I think, you know, the way I got my job as a cadet is probably the same way you end up getting a job now, which is to be present, to be there. Um, and even though the opportunities are far less and I get it that it's a really grim time and I know that we can't ignore what's going on at the moment with regional newspapers and, and regional TV and the ABC. But, um, you know, I went and did work experience during my third year of university and it so happened that while I was there, just tagging along, you know, sort of thinking, oh, okay, you know, going off to court with the older journalist, the cadet who was there um, cracked up and quit and left town. And they just looked at me and went, do you want a job? And I said, great. <laughs> but, you know, that would not have happened if I was not there. So it's just to constantly put yourself in people's faces. Um, 
I, I don't think anyone is really sure at the moment where the jobs are going to be, but if you're not in front of people, then I can guarantee you, you won't get them. I'll tell you, something happened today at the ABC, which I just was quite tickled by, which was um, a young person who I hadn't met before, um, English wasn't his first language, and he sort of walked in the door and he sort of took a look at us. I was sitting there with the executive producer and the supervising producer. It was just after the program. And he just sort of stopped. He said, hello. And we went, hello. And anyway, he ended up, um, I said, oh, take a seat. You know, and he pulled up a chair and he chatted to us for 10 minutes. And the reality is, I'm going to remember that guy. Like that was pretty impressive to just sort of rock up and say good day to these people that you don't know. And I just, you know, so that's there. So even when you're in an office or a place or you get a foot in the door with work experience and we have internships, well, pre-coronavirus, but we were at the ABC, um, you know, you need to then be in front of people and just... Um, and keep the passion, you know, remember why you wanted to do the job in the first place. One of the things that happened to me, which I've never forgotten when I was 17 years old, was that I met Richard Carlton, who was a great um, reporter in Australia. He would, had hosted a current affairs show on the ABC and then went to work for 60 Minutes. Um, sadly, had a massive heart attack on, on a job in Tasmania, um, the Beaconsfield <laughs> mine disaster. But he, I, met, I had the opportunity to meet him when I was 17 and he said to me, you know, if you're going to be a journalist, don't be a mediocre one. There's plenty of them around. <laughs> and, and I was so, I went home and wrote it down. <laughs> don't be <laughs> mediocre. <laughs> but it's just, you know, to just work hard, to put yourself in front of people, to, you know, email and contact and just keep doing it. The hardest move I ever had to make um, as a journalist was actually from the country newspaper, the Gympie Times, to a city newspaper because everyone wanted to get to the city. And this was back when it was, you know, it was going through a really difficult economic time in Australia. Um, this was like 1990, 1991. Yeah. And we had to have. Yeah, and the editor said to me, um, the editor of the city newspaper, he met me begrudgingly, didn't shake, me, didn't shake my hand, gave me about five minutes of his time, and then he said, oh, well, if you want a job, just ring my, ring my secretary, Margaret, you know, every now and then. And I said, well, what do you mean every now and then? And he said, well, you know, just ring Margaret. So I went back to Gympie and I rang Margaret every Tuesday for three months. And I said, hi, Margaret, it's Lisa from the Gimpy Times. And, you know, any jobs going? Anyway, at the end of three months, there was a job and I got a job. But I felt like an idiot every Tuesday ringing Margaret. But, you know, you've got to be persistent. You've yeah. got to pick up the phone too. Like there's so much reliance on, you know, emails and that lack of that personal connection. I think that's the thing that just really blew me away today at the ABC when this guy sort of in person said hello and then sat down and had this conversation because I think, you know, we've, we've moved away from that a bit and I don't think it's good for you as journalists because still I don't care where technology is going, it's the personal connection that is still the important thing. That's how I got my first job actually. I'd sent a few emails and I'd called a few times and missed the manager and then one day the manager made at ABC Radio Melbourne made the mistake of picking up <laughs> and I was like, um, hi, you know, I'm Matilda. This is my experience. Um, I hear you looking for casual producers. I'm available. And then he's like, what's your experience? I said I was still at uni and he said, um, maybe you'd like to do an internship. And I was like, no, I think I'm ready to work. And then he's like, okay, I'll get you in. And I was like, oh, what have I just done? Am I ready to work? Can I do it? But you just kind of have to put yourself out there and be like, yep, I'm, I'm going to be great. And then just figure out if you, how to be great later. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you don't have confidence in yourself, how can you expect someone else to have confidence in you? But at least sound like you're confident. Um, oh, sometimes, I mean, I, I look, trust me, I am the queen of the bluff. Like sometimes <laughs> you just have to put yourself out there and pretend that, you know, you've got this nailed. I can remember when I asked my first question at the White House, I was terrified. <laughs> 
<laughs> this is to the, you know, the spokesperson, not to the president, but it was like, I was terrified. It's a pretty intimidating room. And I just thought, come on, Miller, you've got this, you can do this. <laughs> yeah. Um, and we haven't got a, a lot of time left, but I wonder um, if there's advice that you would give to people uh, watching today about pursuing a career in journalism. What's the advice you would give to them? Pretty much just what I was saying then to, you know, to really not lose hope, to try and keep that passion inside, but to to keep to keep busy and be meeting people all the time and be doing things. And even if you think, oh, this might be taking me off in a different direction, you're still in contact with people. Let everyone know you're looking for a job, you know, as a journalist or in the media. People aren't mind readers. Tell everyone you know. They're all they're all a possible contact. They all possibly know someone. And you know, um, yeah, I guess just to to be persistent, to be persistent. And do you have um, looking back at your career? I know you you know won a Walkley for some of your work and covered some of the biggest stories around the world. But is there a story that's a particular highlight for you when you look at your career that you're proud of or? particularly happy about? Um, look, I'm, I'm proud of the work I did with the parents in Sandy Hook because they felt that I had done them justice and had looked after them and that meant a lot to me. Um, one of the stories that I think about often, which I did for Radio Current Affairs, um, was with the, a widow in from September 11 and her two tiny little girls. And I went back and I stayed in touch with them and I met them again 10 years later in the 10 year anniversary of September 11. And, and the girls were practicing to take part in the ceremony where they read the names of everyone. And they read all the victims' names and the girls were standing there in the lounge room with their mum practicing how to say their dad's name and it just at the time it felt like very powerful journalism it was about that that sounds wanky but it was just it was such a it talked about the passage of time and it just showed that people could recover but the mum still had this you know she said to them don't rush it say his name slowly and it was just Things like that still give me goosebumps. And to think that I was in that lounge room with them, I mean, it's just such a massive privilege, this job absolutely is. And, and finally, um, you've been working on News Breakfast since uh, late last year or middle of last year. August, yep. August. Um, how, how are you finding it? Is, oh, I thought you were going to ask me, what's just... Michael Rowland really like? <laughs> I think he's just as punny in real life as he is on air. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's great. He's a great guy. He and I have been friends since the 1990s. We were at Parliament House together um, in Canberra as young reporters, so I've known him forever and he's just terrific. Um, I love. I, I had no idea that I would love breakfast TV as much as I do. Being able to do the really serious, solid journalism and then... You know, like yesterday I was interviewing Judd Apatow, the Hollywood director, and it's like via Zoom, as we all do these days with everything, but it's still, it's such a buzz. Like I get, you know, I still, I'm in a WhatsApp group with my school friends still, and I send them a note saying, you're not going to believe this. <laughs> I interviewed Judd, you know, like it's just, it's great. It's fantastic. I, I still get excited by it and I get excited by the journalism and I think that's where we started our conversation tonight. Yeah, a uh, nice place to finish. Thank you so much for joining us, Lisa. Lisa Miller is current uh, co-host of ABC News Breakfast. You can catch her weekdays 6 till 9 um, on the ABC channel with Michael Rowland. Uh, she's also, as you've heard, been an experienced foreign correspondent and had a, a strong involvement to the DART Centre for Journalism and Trauma. And I believe they've got resources on their website if people are interested in finding out more about how to look after yourself and how to um, do um, interviews in a thoughtful and respectful way when you're dealing with people with trauma. Um, you've been watching the edit on Zoom. Uh, it's the Melbourne Press Club's place for students and young and early career journalists 
to learn more about their industry, meet people who are in it, and to network. Um, my name is Matilda Morozzi. I hope to be joining you soon, maybe for another webinar or otherwise for uh, another Zoom session. Thanks so much. Thank you.